Well, thank you for being here. Let me, um, let me, best I can, I'm going to give a little bit of a formal intro, but nonetheless. Um, so here we are with the founder and CEO, right, of True. Zero Shoes, um, which you can see them behind you, which, and I'm, I'll get to the, which is fascinating because oftentimes you think of the barefoot shoes are things that don't look good. <laughs> Right. Well, and, only because the original ones made you look like, you know, a gorilla. And uh, uh, and then there's a whole bunch that make you look like a clown. And there's this is this is one of our challenges is making something that's actually good for human feet yeah. that actually look like something you'd want to put on human feet. Yeah. So it looks like you nailed it. We'll get into those in just a moment. So anyways, so from what I understand, you're one of still one of the fastest men alive that's over 50 years old. Uh, I just turned 60. So for men. Oh. Are, so for men over 60, um, I haven't set an All-American time yet as a 60-year-old because I just turned 60 recently. But for men over 55, I was a Masters All-American, which made me one of like the top 15 or 20 fastest guys in the country for men over 55. Oh, that's fascinating. Right on, brother. That, that's pretty damn cool. And then also, this is the part I love, I think, the most. You also uh, you do some stand-up comedy. Well, I did. That was my day job for 10 years. I have not been on a stage for a while and I try to avoid comedy clubs because I'm allergic to the stench of desperation. Got it. So, Got it. Uh, <laughs> and then but, clearly, clearly an entrepreneur by heart, uh, you know, and, and I think you've done a lot of amazing things. And this is one of your, I think one of your babies. Is that correct? Uh, it's my only baby currently. The others have either um, f flown the coop or whatever analogy you want to use or whatever. But yeah, yeah, I've never had an actual job. So unless I created it. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's dive in a little bit. Um, I think one of the first questions I have to ask, how does one even, where does it come up in your brain? I think I'm going to uh, just, you know, alleviate what I've known from day one. As long as I can walk, I put shoes on my feet. Eventually, I get really picky. I elevate my heel. I do all these different things. I buy all these fascinating shoes that then in theory make me run faster. They make me look better. All of these things. How does someone all of a sudden be like, no, I think I'm just going to try barefoot running. How did, how did that start for you? Um, well, I got back into sprinting when I was 45, so 15 years ago, and I was getting injured pretty much constantly for the next two years. Like literally, I'd have maybe a week where I wasn't injured, and then something would happen. I'd pull, twist, break, whatever the hell it was. And after a couple of years of this, um, a friend of mine who's a world champion runner, which I was living in Boulder, Colorado, and to say world champion runner is another way of saying my neighbor, because they're everywhere. Uh, but this was a really good friend of mine who said, why don't you try running barefoot to see if you learn anything about why you're getting injured all the time? And the short version of the story is that I learned that I had a form problem that I couldn't feel when I was in a shoe that looked like this because of all the cushioning and all the padding and what it did to my gait. Um, and uh, more, I learned how to naturally correct that problem because the short form is that when you're running barefoot, doing it with good form feels great, doing it with bad form feels like crap. And so uh, that natural form change by getting that feedback about feeling good or feeling bad is what led me to getting rid of my injuries, becoming faster, et cetera. And I wanted that natural movement experience as much as I could have it. Uh, and I got, A, I got tired of arguing with people about whether it was legal for me to get into their store or restaurant in bare feet. And my wife got tired of me coming into the house on our white carpets with my bare feet that had just been outside. So I knew about the Tarumara Indians in Mexico who run in sandals made out of scraps of tires strapped to their feet. Uh, and I made my version of that as a way of solving both those problems. I could get into a restaurant, I could get home, kick those off, everything's cool. And I was just doing this as a goofy little hobby. And one day, uh, like I made some shoes for my wife and some other people and they'd tell two friends and they'd tell two friends and I'd made, I don't know, 50, 60 pairs of these. And a guy says, I'm writing a book on barefoot running. And if you had a website for this hobby of yours, uh, making sandals, I could put you in the book. Well, I've been an internet marketer for 30 years. So I built hundreds of websites. I rush home and I pitch this incredible opportunity to my wife who assures me that it's a really stupid idea and a waste of time and it won't make any money. And I don't know what you're thinking. And I, um, I'm a good husband. So I told her I wouldn't do it. And then after she went to bed, I built a website because, you know, I'm a typical husband. So, uh, and then it just took off. And here we are 13 years later having my, Lena says it best. Actually, once she saw that this was a real thing, she's a brilliant operations and finance person. She goes, okay, I'm all in. You're in charge of product and marketing. I'm in charge of, you know, keeping the business alive. And her line is really simple. She goes, there's enough shoe companies in the world. There's no reason for another, unless your shoes change people's lives. 
And we literally have tens of thousands of reports from people who say that what we're doing has changed their life, not because we're doing some magic technology because we're getting out of the way and using the magic technology called your body to let it do what it's supposed to do. And that's been, you know, keeping us going. Plus discovering that what the footwear companies have been doing for the last 50 years, they know that they have not been providing benefits. They know they have not been improving performance and reducing injury. They know that in many cases they're creating the problems they claim to be curing. I find that morally reprehensible and I don't like when people make money by lying to other people. So I want to try and do something about that too. Mm. A lot there I want to comment. So first of all, the, the part that letting the body do it, what it's supposed to do naturally, I think that's a lost art. That's, that's the question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the question. I think so many people we forget to do like, what does my body? Well, we, want? well, we forget a simple thing. Um, human bodies have evolved over a long period of time that fundamentally most of the stuff works pretty well. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but improving on that is really, really challenging. And it's really easy to convince people that you're improving things despite evidence to the contrary, if you're a smart marketer, if you're a clever marketer. And that's what's been going on for the last 50 years with footwear. I mean, look, holding this thing up again, let me, this is a typical running shoe. Let me ask this question. Is that the shape of your foot? No. Yeah. And if it is, it isn't supposed to be. So why are they making something that is not the shape of your foot and shoving your foot into that? What's that going to do when you squeeze your toes together like that? Uh, nothing good. <laughs> you know, let's think about doing push-ups. Do you do push-ups like this? Or do you do push-ups like this? Do you do push-ups like this. Why? Because that gives you better force production, better balance. Same thing with your feet. So here's another one. Why is the heel elevated? I mean, what does that do to your posture when you suddenly elevate your heel? It puts pressure on your knees and your back. So why are we doing that? We have more nerve endings in the soles of our feet than anywhere but our fingertips and lips. Can you feel the ground through all that stuff? No. So your brain isn't getting the information that it needs to control your body effectively. Oh, by the way, you have more, uh, a quarter of the bones and joints of your whole body and your feet and ankles. Joints are meant to move. That's for balance, agility, and mobility. That's not even where your foot bends. So now you can't even move in the right way. By the way, this thing called toe spring, that puts strain on your tendons and is only there because since the rest of the sole is so stiff, if they made it flat um, and you, you can't really bend it down. So if they made it flat, you'd be slapping the ground every time you walk. So they build this thing in to accommodate the fact that they screwed up with this thing. So, oh, and then last but not least, and I know people are gonna argue with me and say, yeah, but I need these things. I pronate, despite the fact that pronation is not a real problem. It was a made up diet. Well, it's a real thing. That's part of the natural gait cycle. It's part of the natural spring mechanism of your lower limb. But the idea that it's a problem came from the fact that they built this highly, this, this uh, elevated heel shoe, which makes you land on your heel. Your heel is a ball so that makes you unstable. So now you pronate and that's a problem that you have. No, no, no. It's a problem that this shoe gave me. If you watch professional runners, you'll see marathon runners who pronate more than anyone you've ever seen in your life before. It doesn't stop them from being the fastest men in the world because it's not a problem. There's a, I'll stop ranting in a second, I promise. There's a, um, there's a, a, a researcher named Simon Bartold who used to be totally anti-pronation. Now he's not anti-pronation. And you ask him why? He goes, because the research shows that it's not a problem unless you're hyper-pronating because the shoe is making you do that. You can stop doing that. So here's another one where people will argue with me. I need arch support. Well, um, the research is very clear. You support any joint, put your cast in an arm, uh, cast an arm, put your arm in a cast, support that joint. It gets weaker over time. Research shows the same thing happens when you put an arch in your shoe. You get up to 17% weaker in as little as 12 weeks. Why is the arch support in there? Because when you land on your heel and your foot comes down flat, your arch is not being used properly. The bones aren't aligned to use the arch. You're putting strain on the tendons and that's causing things like plantar fasciitis. So instead they put an arch support so you don't need to use your arch because, and therefore it's not being strained the same way. So it can feel better, but you've just made your foot weaker, which means that when you get out of your shoe, maybe you can't walk across your hardwood floor properly or you can't balance properly when you get older. So everything about this modern design came from this one simple idea. Let's elevate the heel and put some padding under there. And then everything else came after that uh, that caused nothing but problems. But again, people will say, but I need these things because that's what we've been taught for years and years and years and years and years. It's just never been true. I love the fact that your starting point here is the actual true health and mechanics of the human body. Because- yeah. Well, uh, sorry, I, let me say this one last thing. 
footwear for the first 40,000 years that humans were wearing footwear looked like this. Something to protect your foot, something to hold that on your foot, maybe some insulation, maybe some different things for traction. That's it. This is a 50 year old invention that has never been proven to be valuable. You mentioned get people getting, you know, you put on different shoes to get faster. Some, some researcher did the math. Jesse Owens in a super thin shoe with giant spikes on a cinder track, this much slower than Usain Bolt. Mm. So it's not about the shoes. It's not about the track. What is it? It's about the athlete. Yeah, I think that I think I think that's getting more and more obvious every year that they can put anything on the best of the best athletes and they're going to still be the best of the best. Right. And and well and related to that. So, you know, people say, well, this marathon guy, he's wearing that shoe. It's like, cool. Are you a 105 pound Kenyan running at 26 miles, you know, 26 miles and two, a little over two hours? If you're not, why do you care what he's doing? Which, by the way, he probably won't be able to keep doing that once he's about 35 or so. And you want to keep doing it for your whole life. He's doing it to try to make a living to support himself, his family, and maybe his entire village. You're doing it to be healthy. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be happy. We want you to be running down the street and not look like you're doing it to torture yourself, but you're enjoying yourself. You know, you can spot a barefoot runner from 50 yards. They have a weird um, look on their face. What's it called? Um, smiling. Because uh, they're having a good time. You know, now, I'm not saying run barefoot. I mean, it's great. It can change your life. But I know most people won't. That's cool. That's why we do this. Yeah. So what's interesting. So I've been a chiropractor for the last 25 years and I do a lot of extremity adjusting foot, ankles, knees, wrists, shoulders, whatever it may be. And one of the most fascinating things is when I tell people that you just what you just mentioned there, you've got probably a third, at least a quarter of all the bones are in your feet in the entire human body and hundreds, uh, yeah, probably a hundred, at least muscles and tendons there. Yeah. And one subtle little misalignment there can alter everything above just like just like anything else like a house if you just make it a little crooked and that subtle little misalignments it, it's it's fascinating Stephen, because every time we put ourselves in a shoe that elevates the heel and this is why i love that you know mechanics here because not many people understand this when it comes to footwear and how important our feet are you right. elevate that heel and then the whole body starts to zigzag back and forth one of the most interesting and obvious things over all these years is after weekends, my ladies always come in, especially after a wedding, <laughs> they will come in with neck pain and headaches and thoracic yeah. pain all the way up to the top of the spine, simply because, and they'll even tell me, oh, I was in those heels all week long. And now just imagine, yes, you've lowered it a little bit, but all of our shoes, just like you're saying, literally the ones that I have on my feet, have some level of elevated heel support. Yeah. And then, and then you hear the common things. I got old knees all of that. So in your, in your, in your travels, in your research, learning these mechanics, you must have learned a lot about what I'm talking about there and become kind of an expert in just general mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. I have a knack for that stuff. Um, I've been, I mean, I've been basically teaching various movement things since I was 10. Uh, so I've taught everything from running gymnastics, yoga, Tai Chi, Actually, not so much. I did lead some yoga classes, uh, Tai Chi, Zen archery, tap dancing. Um, I have a knack for figuring out physical things. And then, and then more importantly, breaking down the mythology to the essential part and finding like, here's the easy thing to do. Here's the way to play with this instead of all the extra stuff that you don't need to burden yourself with. You know, it's interesting that I've also just kind of noticed over the years that, so I live down here in the beach, right on the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And uh, so there's a lot of people in sandals and a lot of people barefooted. And one of the things that I've noticed consistently is that the yogis and the surfers have strong, healthy feet and generally are healthier people with better postures. Well, and, and you may notice this, um, uh, when you check out their feet, their strong, healthy feet, you said the two most important words, uh, they don't necessarily have high arches. They don't necessarily have a whole different shape because that's predominantly genetic, but strong and healthy. That's something you can control. Yeah. And yeah. I'm admitting that over the years, my feet have gotten soft. They've gotten wimpy. Yes. I remember growing up in a kid like, and this is the fascinating part as kids. Don't we all just start barefooted? 
yeah. and we and we like get yelled at just like sound like maybe even into your adulthood you got yelled at for not wearing your sneakers out or you didn't bring your shoes with you when you went out to you know whatever to to dinner or to church or something and then somewhere along the way we're told that we have to not only wear sneakers but if we have to get a, a job you might have to cram them in some shoes which is quite fascinating and then that's like where the decline really begins so yeah. self throw i'm throwing myself under the bus where I've definitely, my feet over the years have not as tough as they once were, as, as they once were. Well, two things. One, this is not rocket science. This is simple. It's use it or lose it. Yep. And if you lose it with your feet, you lose it with almost all the rest of your body. They are your foundation. So the second thing is when people think about tough, they do think like calloused and that's not the way it is. So you find a good barefoot runner. They don't have calloused feet. They have now you can have calluses if you're an indigenous person living somewhere, not necessarily because you're running around barefoot all the time uh, from from that's a whole different world. But you find barefoot runners um, in America, for example, accomplished barefoot runners, people who run marathons, people who run ultra marathons, they don't have calluses, they have soft, pliable, really strong, responsive feet. And backing up to your point about, you know, what happens when you put on shoes and how that affects your whole body. The other thing, I'm going to hold up the shoe again, you know, that foam that's in there, the moment you start wearing it, the foam breaks down and that changes things even more. That changes all the kinematics, that changes the alignment, that changes what you can do. I, um, this says something about uh, our, the world we live in. I was in an airport back in the days when people went to airports more than two years ago. And there's a guy in front of me and he had worn out the inside of the foam on his shoes. So his shoes were tipped like this and his ankles were tipped accordingly. So his feet, his ankles were both turned in severe and I grabbed a video of it and I posted that video on Facebook and everyone jumped in. It's like, oh my God, shoes are horrible. Then I posted that video on Instagram and everyone's like, stop shoe sh or no, stop body shaming that guy. I said, body shaming, I'm shoe shaming. So, you know, as soon as you start wearing something, if you don't already have natural form, if you're not already moving correctly, you're going to start wearing out this, the base of that shoe in a way that's going to exacerbate whatever problem you already had getting into that shoe. And you won't notice it because it happens slowly until one day you realize, you know, I'm having a hard time with my, like you said, my knees, my hip, my back, my neck, et cetera. So when you were doing all this and you're doing your research, did you f uncover some, some, some non-truths from the manufacturing companies that were kind of hard to swallow? Did you, was there some crookedness there? I do you have? Um, look, the, here's the biggest one. They all know what I'm saying. Mm. They all know this is legit. They, we've had CEOs and C-level people at multi-billion dollar footwear brands say, oh yeah, this natural movement thing is real. We just can't do it because it would be admitting everything we've said for the last 50 years is a lie. They know it. That's the biggest one. The other biggest one is that these things are, again, anyway, beneficial. And I'll, in fact, I was on a panel discussion with some guys from Brooks and um, here, I'll be pretentious, Adidas or European, because uh, that's it's Adidasler, Adidas. Anyway, uh, or Adidas, doesn't matter to me, not my company. Uh, and they kept saying, well, you know, we want to improve performance and reduce injury, but we haven't proven that we can do that. Because to do that would be really expensive and time consuming, have a lot of confounding factors in a study. And I'm going, dude, if you could make a shoe demonstrably better than the guy sitting next to you, that's worth billions of dollars a year. And you're telling me you haven't done it because it's difficult? That's absurd. Here's hundreds of studies that we have showing that what we're doing is beneficial. So whenever they made some claim about some new thing they're doing, we're doing 3D molded, 3D printed uh, midsoles that are custom made for you. Cool, where's the proof that it works? We're doing an outsole that's made just for you because you're, you know, you have a special movement pattern that you can't change. Cool. Where's your proof that it works? And here's an easy answer for where there's no proof. Um, Nike did a study that came out about two and a half years ago on their best-selling motion controlled padded arch supporting heel lifted running shoe against a new shoe they had developed. And the way they publicized the study and the way the media presented it, because they were lazy and didn't change a word from the press release was new shoe reduces injuries by 20, by 52%. That sounds amazing. And it did in a 12 week study that Nike developed um, in the new shoe, 52% fewer injuries. But then you have to look at the numbers. In the best selling shoe they had, over 30% of the people got injured in that 12 weeks. In the new shoe, only 15% did. So roughly one out of three, one out of seven. Imagine going to a running shoe store and saying, hey, I'm looking for a good shoe. And they pull out that the 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 uh, which one is which uh, the 
uh, their best selling one. They go, well, here's a shoe that's the best seller. And uh, it'll only have a 30% chance of injuring you in the next 12 weeks. One out of three people injured in the next 12 weeks. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want that one. Okay, how about this better one? Only one out of seven people are going to get injured in the next 12 weeks. 15% chance you'll get injured. Don't you have a shoe that's good for me? Uh, yeah, no, we don't, have, we don't have that here. Now, yeah, it's, it's crazy. That is fascinating. The how much marketing and just manipulation of words really can kind of convince us, oh, like I'm, that's, that's, you know, that's the best shoe and I'll reduce injury by this much, but really the injury is being caused often yeah. by the actual shoe. Yeah. And here's the, here's the, the real punchline. When asked why the new shoe seemed to have few, produce fewer injuries in people, uh, the answer was we got rid of many of the protective features in the other shoe. Hmm. So they tried to go closer to what we were doing Mm -hmm. And that got rid of some injuries, but, the, but that's it. I mean, some still one, I mean, 50, look, 50% 50 of runners and 80% of marathoners get injured every year. And people act like that's normal. Prior to 1970, uh, Dr. Irene Davis, uh, when she was at Harvard, loved to point out, if you look in the research about running injuries and look in PubMed and try to find research about the occurrence of running injuries and the cause of running injuries and the treatment of running injuries prior to about 1970, there's nothing in the literature. And if you ask people who are in running groups in the 60s and 70s, like, how often did you guys get injured? They go, what? What, mm -hmm. are, what are you talking about? They were running in shoes that look like this. Mm -hmm. They were, they had strong, healthy feet, just like you said. They were running with proper form, because this is really what we're talking about. It's about form, not footwear. It's about using your body correctly versus having footwear getting in the way of that. They just weren't getting the number of injuries, the type of injuries, the severity of injuries that we're seeing now. Same thing with basketball players. In the 60s and 70s, they're playing basketball in Chuck Taylors. Thin sole, flexible sole, a little too thick, a little too pointy. But fundamentally, you weren't seeing the kind of injuries you see basketball players having now while they're wearing big, thick, stiff, elevated heel, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Irene once asked on, on one of these panel discussions, asked one of the big companies, what problem were you trying to solve and why didn't it work? Mm -hmm. Dead silence. You know, um, speaking of sports that way, so in boxing, they have basically a minimalist shoes. And if you've ever done any sparring or anything and you had your normal sneakers on, you know, in a heartbeat, you can't do this. Yeah. Because your feet won't move properly. The angles won't work. Same thing with wrestlers. There's like a wrestling shoe in it. I would assume it's very similar to what you have there. It's similar ish uh, for both of those. They still tend to make them too narrow. I mean, luckily yeah. for when you're a professional boxer, they'll make things for your feet, but they still tend to make things a little too narrow because by then they've been in shoes that have made their foot squish together. So they're not really doing it. But boxers in particular, uh, they'll do a lot of training barefoot. MMA guys, all barefoot. Um, yeah. Wrestlers usually barefoot when they can, unless they just need that extra traction yeah. that, uh, that they can get. And that's the thing. There's use cases where footwear has uh, more applicability than others. And basically, it's typically about traction or protection. Yeah, so I practice jujitsu, and in jujitsu, if you had a pair of shoes on, it's a detriment. Like, oh it, yeah, it's literally it works against you, which is fascinating. So let me let me be devil's advocate again on something or first first time really. I was say, I just yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, inevitably the conversation of well, my arches, I have flat arches, I have my medium arches because it's so ingrained that you know maybe their pediatrician or their their, you know, their foot doctor, someone said, well, here's your arch status. It gets labeled on their brain. This is my arch. And therefore I hunt down shoes for the rest of my life with this particular arch. My viewpoint has always been, you know, very similar to yours as, you know, looking at the body, you're given what you're given, right? And let's work the best we can with it. That your arch is really kind of predetermined unless you do something to either weaken it, break it down or, or something. So what do you, what's your conversation around that, that, that conversation of, well, I have to have an arch in my shoe. I have to have this. Yeah. It's, I just basically say the same thing you did. It's um, it's not about arch height, which is predominantly genetic. It's about arch strength. And again, it's use it or lose it. And I, you know, I had comedy level flat feet my whole life. If I stepped out of a hot tub or a pool and stepped on the ground, it, you know, it was an oval with a couple of dots. And, and if you looked at the shape of my foot, I mean, there's, I don't even know which muscle that is actually the muscle. So if I'm looking down at my foot right in front of the, the medial ankle there, what's that muscle that can kind of stick out there. It's not the longitudinal arch, but there's another one here. Wait, <laughs> it's this one right here. That yeah. Muscle. That muscle right there. That's what we'll call it. Okay. Anyway, really pronounced. 
Well, as I started going barefoot and in zero shoes, uh, my foot changed shape. That muscle stopped being overused. My arch was actually being used correctly. My foot got a little wider at the front, got a little shorter because the arch pulled up. When I step out of a pool now, it doesn't look like, you know, your prototypical if someone drew a perfect foot, but it looks like a foot. You can see there's an arch. You can see that, I mean, there's, you can actually see two of them, not all three, but suffice it to say, um, it looks like a foot. I was at a chiropractic conference and the guy who was leading it said, um, go feel Sashin's feet. And if he makes you pay five bucks to do it, pay the five bucks because you're going to see they're still kind of flat, but they're really flexible and really strong. And that's what you're looking for. And it's no different than any other part of your body. Where, will, where else is weaker, better than stronger? Nowhere. And how do you get weaker? You don't use something. You support it. You don't let it move. How do you get stronger? You use it. You put it to a test every now and then. You give it something to do. This is, again, this is not complicated. It's just that, like you said, we've been taught these things from the day we were born practically in no small part because footwear companies and certain medical professionals learned they could make money by selling you a story that isn't true. And then you tell that story often enough. I think we know, given what's been going on for the last few years, you tell a lie often enough, suddenly people think it's true. And then you tell that new truth often enough, and then it becomes common knowledge. So that's where we are with footwear. Look, the whole idea about orthotics or insoles, a couple of interesting things. One, uh, statistically, no difference between a $1,000 orthotic that cost someone custom made for you and what you could get from Dr. Scholl's at Target. Mm -hmm. Second thing, those were never developed to be something you wear all the time. It's like if you went to a doctor and you had whiplash because you were in a car accident and he put you in a neck brace and you'd say, well, you know, what do I do now? If he said, oh, you just wear that for the rest of your life. You'd sue the guy from malpractice. But if instead he said, oh, we got to let some things heal. But while you're doing this, we're going to work on flexibility and mobility and strength. It's like, oh, that makes sense. And eventually you're going to take it off. Well, orthotics were designed for the same reason. You have some problem. Well, like let the tissue rest while you're working on strength and mobility and flexibility. And eventually you want to get rid of it. That's why they were designed. But when certain medical professionals found that they could charge you $1,000 for an orthotic, that became the bulk of their income. And it's really hard to pull money out of people's pockets. Yeah. You know, it's heck in my profession that there's a lot, well, there's a lot of practitioners that do that. I see it all the time. We go to the seminars and they have these big booths and, and it always, for those of us who are still really paying attention to mechanics, you scratch your head and be like, was I born deficient of an orthotic? And you know, the answer is no, like I, I was, I didn't miss that, you know, like that, right. that moment in time. Um, you know, let's, let's go back for a second. Wait, hold on, wait, I gotta give you a, I gotta give you a funny version of that. So when I was having all my sprinting injuries, I went to a chiropractor and he said, well, you need this three quarter orthotic. So that meant it only come up to just before the ball of my foot. I said, but when I'm sprinting, I'm only on the ball of my foot. I'm never doing anything where this orthotic is going to be used in any way. I never step on it at all. And he goes, yeah, but, um, uh, stumped him. Yeah. So we used to have a bucket. This, this is kind of funny. We used to have a bucket for things that people didn't need that came into my office with. <laughs> and there would be all kinds of things. There'd be different like medications in there. There'd be orthotics and these inserts and all this stuff. People would say, what's going on with that bucket? Like, and I would just tell them, those are things that people don't need, but they think they do. And and, and so, you know, that some of those orthotics can be really expensive. They oh, yeah. form fit them, they send them away to the specialist and they send them back and they're customized for you. And I, one of the things, if, and everyone's listening to this, and you may have invested a little bit of money and I'm not kind of, you know, break your stones or anything yet. The truth mm -hmm. is most likely you formed your foot, you created an, a, an insert on an imbalanced system. It never got right. balanced. Right. So now you're manipulation, you're manipulating the manipulation. It's worse. It's worse. So uh, typically when someone gets fitted for an orthotic, it's in their bare feet on a flat surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then they put that orthotic in a shoe that has built-in arch support already. The geometry is completely different. Mm. And then as the shoe breaks down, the geometry changes again. And so I was in the lab with Dr. Bill Sands, who used to be the head of biomechanics and engineering for the U.S. Olympic Committee. And to make a long story short, Bill showed how for almost every human being other than highly trained middle distance runners, uh, every different shoe that you put on changes your gait in some way. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, oh, so that means that if you believe in orthotics, you would need a different orthotic for every one of those shoes. And you then need to change it as that shoe changed shape. And he just started laughing knowingly. It's like, yep, 
Yep. And uh, that suggests there's a problem. I mean, look, here's the biggest thing. If these shoe companies are so damn smart, why is there a multi-billion dollar aftermarket thing for orthotics and inserts to make them quote unquote better? You would think they would have figured it out by now. And I think, Steve, that's one of the ones where sometimes we have to just pause and, and look around and be like, whoa, wait a minute here. You know, you walk in a you know, fancy runner shoe store right now, right? And you walk in and they have a wall of their best sellers. And then on the other wall, they have the orthotics that you need to get with your top seller. And if you, if you pause and look at the insanity of it, sometimes you go, what are, am I in, you know, am I in a, a comedy show here? This is, is kind of funny. All right. So I want to back you up a little bit. So roughly 15 years ago, you're running 45 years old. You get back into sprinting. You're starting to notice some injuries. Because it seems almost counterintuitive. You then decide, all right, I'm going to scratch my shoes. I'm going to probably get more uncomfortable first. That never occurred to me. Oh, wow. Okay. Literally, literally that first barefoot run, I was like, I was just curious. And I'll, and I'll tell you the biggest thing that happened. We were running, as a bunch of us, uh, we were running on grass, on concrete, on trails, over wooden bridges. Um, so I'm a sprinter. I'd never run more than a mile of my own volition and hated everything past the first hundred meters. <laughs> so, but I was so fascinated on that run by experimenting. Like, what can I learn? What happens if I move my legs differently? What happens if I have a faster cadence, more steps per minute, but I run at the same speed? What happens if I have a slower cadence? What happens if I run faster? What happens if I run slower? What happens if I land on this part of my foot or that part of my foot? I was just really so curious and I was getting so much feedback. It was just fascinating. I was entranced by it. And at the end of this run, um, somebody had a GPS watch on. I said, how far was that out of curiosity? She goes, that's a little over 5k. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? And I could have kept going. We just all stopped as a group, but I was having so much fun and it was so interesting. I had no idea that I'd run 5k. Now here's the kicker. I also ended up with a big blister on the ball of my left foot. Now, I have discovered that most people in that situation would go, oh, see, this is nonsense. I got a blister. I, for whatever reason, thought, huh, how come my right foot is fine? And by the way, how come my left leg is the one that gets injured more often than my right leg? Interesting. So the next week, we were going to do another one of these barefoot runs, and I still had this gaping hole in the ball of my left foot. And I thought, okay, if I can find a way to run that doesn't hurt the gaping hole, then maybe I'm not doing the thing that caused the gaping hole to begin with. Mm -hmm. So let's give it 10 minutes, see what happens. If it doesn't work, I'll wait till the gaping hole heals. Maybe I'll try it again, maybe not. I don't know, let's see. Nine minutes and 30 seconds of agony later, I'm about to call it a day. And in one stride, everything changed. No pain, got way more fun. Literally my running went from a struggle to like, oh, this is a blast. I was going faster, it was easier. My breathing got better. And what I didn't know at the time, but I would, what I discovered soon thereafter, was that I was doing a thing called overstriding. I was landing with my foot in front of my body. And when you land with your foot in front of your body, it's like putting on the brakes. You literally slow down and have to re-accelerate by pulling your foot across the ground. But when I was landing, because I'm a sprinter and I thought I'm supposed to land on the ball of my foot, which you are when you're sprinting, I was landing overstriding and then pointing my toes. So I'm putting the brakes on, on the ball of my foot. That's what caused the gaping hole. Mm. And I just basically stopped doing that um, at that nine minute and 31 second mark, and then just locked in that form. It didn't take me very long. Mm -hmm. And then every, I mean, it's been 13 years. I literally can't think of a time where I've had any injury anywhere close to what I had during those first two years. Like the other day, last week, I'm just literally just jogging around the office and I felt something in my calf feel like a little out of whack. And so I stopped and then it, you know, was sore for a day and a half and then felt fine. That was it. I mean, that's like the extent of the injuries that I've had in the last 13 plus years. I'm not saying that's going to be true for everyone. Shit happens. But uh, in fact, the only injuries I've gotten in the last two year, uh, last 15 years, same injury twice. I stubbed my toe and cut, you know, got a little cut on the front of my toe. That was it. Yeah. So, you know, that part you said, well, like, eventually you were striding and all of a sudden, boom, you had that moment. Yeah. The other part that we're, we haven't even talked about is what probably took part of part of part of what that was was probably waking up that neural component to your brain oh yeah yeah yeah. well yeah. i don't think that happened i don't know that that happened immediately but you're totally onto it um uh, do you want to say more about how people i'm gonna i'm gonna prompt you for this one how people don't understand 
what the brain is actually doing when it comes to the information you're getting from your feet? Well, it's interpreting and send a message back. And that's, that's probably, that's it. And if it doesn't get the message, it doesn't send the message back. Oh, it's even better. If it doesn't get the message, it shuts down. Yeah. It basically says, oh, you're not going to be sending me that info. All right, then I'm going to go offline. Yeah. And so it does take a little while for different people uh, to get back into natural movement because of how their brain has literally changed its shape. There's a book called The Brain That Changes Its Shape. And this is what happens. If you tape, this is a funny one. If you tape your first two fingers together, your brain eventually starts thinking and acting like you only have one finger there. If you take the tape off, you literally can't move them independently. If you stroke your finger, it'll feel like one weird finger instead of two. Luckily, your brain though is wired for working correctly. Take the tape off, get some motion in there. It'll figure it out. Same thing with being barefoot or or natural movement. Take off, uh, like... um, Every couple of years, some researcher comes up with basically a device to vibrate your foot, to add more sensation where you've been not getting it for a while. And they go, look, it's amazing. Elderly people have better balance. Parkinson's people have fewer symptoms, et cetera. And I go, hey, I wrote a blog post years ago. If you can't find a magic vibrating insoles, try this. Just take off your damn shoes and go for a walk outside. And I got an email from a guy, 82-year-old guy, a few weeks later saying, I was looking for the magic vibrating insoles. I found your blog post. Since I couldn't find the insoles, I put that to the test. That was two weeks ago, and I just threw away my walker because his brain started getting that information, which then sent it back to his feet, designed to move for balance, agility, mobility, and that helped. I mean, again, it's not rocket science. It's use it or lose it. Yeah, 100%. And it's fascinating, too. If you go barefoot and you intentionally change surfs, maybe go on gravel, then on grass and sand, yes. it'll light your brain up. Yes. And it's just Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, all these brain issues. There's a, there's a lack of firing that's taking place. And then sugar and all that junk, too. But this lack of firing, lack of using the neurology to lighten up these brain centers, so much of it goes back to the feet. You know, let's go back to the feet um, for our ladies that are listening. A big issue I see is bunions. Mm-hmm. And you want to know what causes a bunion? You know this, but you got it. Smash the toes, ra- raise the heel. That's it. Yeah. That, in, in a nutshell. And yeah. you probably privy to this, but do you know it's it's becoming more and more common as they squish them together, the toe next to it pops up. Mm-hmm. They're cutting them off now. Yeah. And this is not, an, oh yes. I I probably have now almost a dozen patients through my career. They've cut that says, yes, I know they cut it out because it no longer fit. And it's, it's almost mind boggling that the education and that that's one of the things I really wanted to bring out here tonight. This, so this is the health made simple show. That's, that's what this is. So the simple part of this is let's get back to the grassroots here. Let's put our feet in a a place that they can interpret the earth, talk to the brain and have this constant communication back and forth. When we smash them, smoosh them in like that. And that angle that you showed almost all of our shoes, they're angling to a tip and you start to bend those toes. We're in trouble. Yeah. In fact, if you, if you pull your first toe, your big toe in, uh, the other thing that it does is it makes it so you can't actually use your arch. So you're losing strength in your foot as well. In addition to having mobility problems. Um, yeah, it really, holy moly, that blew me away. What you just said. Yeah, literally cutting that toe off because it doesn't fit. And the bummer part is that, so of course, the therapy would be, hey, listen, let's get your feet out of these shoes, let's put them flat on the ground. And they don't want, no one wants to have their shoe naked because it's not looking so good because you got this big bunion and they're all crooked. Yet I've also watched the opposite where they start to get a little space back or I'll ask, oh, yeah. they'll, they'll come in barefooted after they get um, their, their toes done and they have those little spacers. Yeah. And they'll tell me that's the best they feel. Yeah. And so we, we kind of start there for those that'll do it or just practice walking around at home. And, and let me, let me say, there's some people who literally can only take like one or two steps. Mm. You know, it's like, start where you are. The, the only problem uh, there, you don't want to do too much too soon, but the problem is you don't know if you did too much unless you do too much. Yeah. So you want to take it easy. I mean, what you may need to do if, if literally taking a step is problematic just find something to massage your feet, find something and not just like, uh, like find something, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for. We have a thing on our website. It's called a neuro ball. It was invented by a surgical podiatrist named Emily Splickle, who found that there's a certain pattern uh, you can build into, into something that that pattern stimulates the mechanoreceptors in your feet that tells your brain what's going on really, really well. 
And so just something where you're getting that stimulation. Um, we have, we also sell a thing called a rocks mat. I don't think I have one here. It's basically, I'm looking, it's a plastic mat with bumps on it. So you can step on that and just, you know, get a little foot massage, get a little stimulation, get a little flexibility. You just want to start using them a little bit. You can put a towel on the ground, step on the towel with one foot at a time and scrunch it. So pull, you know, you pull the towel into a little ball, then stretch it out and do it again. There's like lots of little things you can do just to get your feet working again. If you're able to do that, if you have no problem walking, just, you know, like you said, walk on these different surfaces and see what that's like. If you can run a little bit, run for like 20 seconds. That's it. See how you feel the next day. If you feel great the next time, go out for 30 seconds. No rush. Okay. If it feels like something hurt, maybe it feels like you just use too many muscles in a way that you haven't before. Wait till you feel better. Try it again until it feels good. If it feels like you may have hurt something, definitely wait till that feels better and try a little less and pay attention to, to not overstriding. Get your feet underneath you. Don't push off the ground. Don't like use your feet like you're doing calf raises. You want to think about lifting your foot off the ground. So the image I use is if you stepped on a bee and it stings you, you don't push off the ground. That would put the stinger further in your foot. You reflexively lift your foot off the ground by flexing your hip. You want to use that same idea of lifting your foot off the ground. And you want to maybe pick up your cadence a little bit. So not a lot, just if you're taking X number of steps a minute, there's no magic number. Just take a few more steps per minute. Move your feet a little more Fred Flintstone-like, you know, a little faster, but don't run faster. Just move your feet a little faster. That'll take care of some of those things as well. But basically use fun as your guide. If it doesn't feel good, try something different till you till it does. Love it. So I'm making a note to myself right here. Bart, Steven says, take 20 steps and see how that goes. 20 because seconds. 20 steps. Steps. Okay. Because you know what I'm thinking right now? I'm thinking I'm going, I'm going for run tomorrow barefoot. Yeah, yeah. do it. You know, <laughs> nice, so nice, smooth, hard surface. People think, oh, I'm going to go barefoot. I need to be on the grass. That's just like taking the foam from the shoe and sticking it all on the whole planet. Plus, you don't know what's in the grass. There's things you don't want to step on or in. So a smooth, hard surface is going to give you the most feedback which is what you need. Again, this is all about telling your brain what's happening with the rest of your body so it can find the way to move correctly. When I had that big blister on the ball of my left foot, what I was doing when I was taking that next run was not trying to find a way to move my blistered, gaping whole foot a bit different. I was paying attention to the right foot. It's like, what's that one that feels good doing? And I didn't even think about it. My brain kind of went, oh, I get it. I got to do that on the other side too. Okay, it's all clear to me now. Wow, that's a big topic right there, my friend. The focus, we also have been trained most of our lives to focus on what we don't want, what we don't like, and what hurts. Well, it was a good thing when we needed to know that for survival. For survival, like, correct. We, we never learned to, we never developed the ability to look at a glass of water and determine if there was a harmful bacteria in there just by looking at it. We developed the ability to drink a glass of water and then pay exquisite attention to whether something is really wrong all of a sudden. And then, you know, not get water from that place ever again, or don't eat that berry again, or don't do that movement ever again. So, um, you know, paying attention to what's wrong kept us alive. For right now, almost everything's pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. We don't have this many survival entities that we once did. We don't have a bear chasing us most of the time. Well, those dogs behind you will only eat you when you're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and maybe they those guys, if I don't get, if I don't cut it up for them, they're not eating it. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, if you're yeah. if you're down for the count, eventually they're going to go. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Right. Eventually, yes. All right. So what I'm hearing here is give it give it time. If you if you think that this no might rush. be something, that, yeah, no rush. And that's and I think that's beautiful because I think too often we try to rush right to it. Or and how about what if what if someone wanted to weight load and like they wanted to go lift weights. Exactly. Look, uh, imagine again that you've broken your arm, the arm comes out of the cast, do you immediately go to the gym and do eight hours of bicep curls? No, mm -hmm. you do some work to make sure you got the flexibility again, because you haven't been able to move it for a while. And then you start adding weight slowly while you're working on the flexibility. Same thing here. Think of it like going to the gym, do a simple small set, see how you feel, eventually add a rep, eventually add a set, eventually add some time. I love it. And I know it's something that um, I've been waiting to have you on because I, I, this would be my commitment to make my feet stronger. It is um, all, so many things that I think a lot of us do as we enjoy having the opportunity to make choices with our health. We're always looking for that next, the next thing to stack on. And, 
getting stronger, healthier feet. And, I, you know, unfortunately, I do a lot of yoga and I do some jujitsu. So I'm in my bare feet, but I'm also in my clinic all day. And it's so mm -hmm. funny. My staff was, I said, my vision was I was going to be practicing on the beach and I have an open winded office and shorts and bare feet. My one, my one staff member says the other day, he says, you know, you own the place. You can do that if you want. It was it was it was interesting input. So I'm making a commitment here, bold one, that I am going to start to you know go minimalist here. I, I'm looking at those shoes. Those are awesome. So, so tell me a little about the company. Tell me a little about how does one find them? How do you even know? So meaning, typically, if I have to buy a pair of shoes, I have to go to the shoe store, right, and find out which arch and you know, am I a pronator, am I a supernator, and all of that? Do I can I just toss all that out? How, how can I if I wanted to get a zero shoe? Um, well, I'm not going to make a blanket statement for everyone because there's going to be some person who's got some specific, unique situation, and you know, etc. By and large, uh, but by and large, yeah, all of these are fundamentally the same. So we do a couple of things. So wider foot shaped toe box, so your toes can spread and work naturally uh, low to the ground for balance and agility. We don't elevate your heel. We don't have that toe spring. The soles are really, the whole thing's really flexible. So your foot can do whatever wow. it needs to do. Um, the soles are designed to give you traction and protection and there's trail versions, road versions, etc. cetera. Uh, we have a, a, a slip resistant shoe for doctors, nurses, restaurant workers. Um, and, but also they're there to give you the ground feedback. So your brain can feel what your feet are telling you and then come back and let your feet move naturally. You can have more or less barefoot feeling because they're all designed to be worn barefoot. If you want, you can take out the sock liner or the insole. If you want more barefoot feeling. Oh, the soles have a 5,000 mile sole warranty. What? Yeah. Most running shoes, they say three to 500 miles. You got to replace them. That's because all this foam and everything breaks down and they've made it so that the rubber breaks down around the same time the foam does. What a shock. And, um, and so when we first had designed our rubber, we approached the manufacturer and said, here's the performance characteristics that we would like. And the guy says, but that's not how they make outsole rubber outsoles for shoes. And we went, yeah, no joke. That's why we want to do it this way. So um, they're also crazy lightweight. We've had people say they come home at the end of the day, they forget to take them off. Some people have said they've gone to bed still wearing them because they forgot they had them on. So you can pretty much pick anything. We have a, um, a shoe quiz, a shoe selector that you can find on our website that'll ask you what you're trying to do. Do you want more or less barefoot feeling? A handful of questions. And then it'll recommend a few products, but they're all again, fundamentally the same. It's all designed to let your feet do what feet are made to do and let the body do what it's made to do as well. Like we want your, we want your feet to do their job so the rest of your body can do its job. I absolutely love that. So I see behind you is even almost like a boot version. So are yeah. they a little more rugged to maybe handle some, a farm or something well, like that? So I can't see what you're looking at. Um, that, that black one up there? Yeah. That's a snow boot. That's a fully oh. rugged snow boot that's still like crazy lightweight. It's not as much natural movement because you need more insulation. But wait, hold on. Is there anything inside it? No. But still bends and flexes like nothing you've ever seen before and lighter weight than anything you've ever worn for a, that kind of a snow boot. Um, we've also got, wait a point it over there. There's also, um, that's our daylight hiker down at the bottom. The Mika is a um, casual canvas boot for women. So we have, we've got basically casual and performance boots, shoes, and sandals that people use for everything from taking a walk to running 100 mile ultra marathons. Let's say you guys really nailed it when it came to the style it's because this is not what you think of when you think of like a minimalist shoe. You yeah. think you're walking around like the great ape, right? With like these big, you know, dunk, dunk, dunk. so those are fantastic. So zero shoes.com, but zero with an X. It's zero with an X, except that if you accidentally or your computer accidentally corrects it to Z-E-R-O shoes, it will still get to us thanks to the magic of the internet. I love it. I love it. And then, uh, Stephen, if the people wanted to get in contact with you, your company, anything you're doing out there right now that they can follow get or get more information from? Oh, man, there's so many things that I'm not allowed to talk about because they're not happening yet. Um, let's just say, actually, if you go to Chris McDougall, who wrote the book Born to Run that really catalyzed this whole natural movement barefoot idea back in 2009, has a new book coming out. Uh, December 6th called Barefoot, uh, sorry, called Born to Run 2. It's all how to actually do this, how to, how to learn how to run in a way that's enjoyable, that's natural, that's fun. And uh, so there's a lot happening with that. That's going to be super exciting. And we're going to be helping Chris out as are pretty much every other company that I can think of, because why wouldn't you? So, but if you go to his website, um, it's at, or sorry, better go to his Instagram, uh, which is Chris McDougall with two L's, Chris McDougall author, then you'll see that he's talking about our 
Zelen, that blue and white shoe up there, and our Mesa Trail, our trail running shoe. So that's one of the exciting things is that Chris has been talking about what we're up to, which has been uh, really fun. And then uh, there we go. Um, the, and um, what else we have going on? We just have a bunch of new shoes coming out for the fall of this year that we'll be announcing sometime in September. Don't know when they're showing up. And then more stuff in the spring that we're super excited about. We're just basically, we're just continuing to make things that people like and find and and people then tell us what they need next it's like the slip resistant shoe that we made happened because people kept saying i'm working in a restaurant i love your shoes but i need a slip resistant version so we made one so we're just listening to what people tell us and then we follow their lead basically um, and you can find us by the way on instagram and facebook and twitter and youtube etc at zero shoes or slash zero shoes wherever you happen to at or slash Love it. Love it. Well, you know, um, great conversation. I appreciate and love all that you're doing, especially the fact that it comes from this. You can tell that you're passionate about what you're doing. Um, Again, you know, it's because we're doing the right thing. It, it, it's a rare opportunity to be able to tell the truth <laughs> and make money by doing so. And I don't mean make money personally. I mean, make the money that we need as a company to continue growing the company to survive. We've been doing this for 13 years. It's a uh, apparently a very rare thing for a startup that started in a corner of a spare bedroom of a house to turn into the size of the company we are now, all organically, all because people said, we want you to survive. And we could not be more grateful and more thankful that every day we hear from people saying, you know, you changed my life. Absolutely love it. So I, I think, uh, so I'll give you one last question here. And that is just, if you had to give our audience here, like one last tidbit to help them become superhuman, one simple health tip, what, what, what would you leave with? Well, that's a really good question. Um, get a good television. Get a good television. <laughs> now, here, now here's why I say that. Okay. I need <laughs> so, to hear this. Yeah. Um, I know it's a little counterintuitive. <laughs> uh, so Lane and I, we, and everyone in our company, we work really hard. And um, there's the literally one of the things that's allowed us to survive personally, it's getting a little personal, is at the end of the day, um, usually I make food. If you heard a little beep or a little bing a little second ago, that was my wife saying sauerkraut pizza, which is uh, one of the things that she makes. And it's a frozen pizza, add sauerkraut. Uh, I, I'm the cook in the family, but sauerkraut pizza is really good. So uh, we come home. If I get home early enough, I make dinner. If I don't come home early enough, she will have something ready to go. And then we sit in front of the TV and snuggle and watch TV and relax and turn our brain off, um, which is basically another way of saying, you know, do what you need to do to be happy and healthy. And um, it, it, like I like to say, um, what I always say to people is go out, have fun and live life feet first. But that go out and have fun part is important. I said it before, if you're not having fun when you're running, do something different so you are, you know, use that as a guide. If you're, if you think you need to meditate for an hour a day and that's stressing you out, guess what? Stop meditating for an hour a day. If you think you need to be in the gym two hours a day and it's stressing you out, guess what? Find a different way of doing that. If, if, if it's not fun, if it makes you stressed out, find a different way. Now that doesn't mean you're going to be happy all the time. Things happen. But if you're not using that as a guidepost, I would recommend that one for the fun of it. Yeah. Amen to that. So that that's beautiful right there. Thank you for that. That's uh, I think that's something we can hear every day of our lives. Just have fun today. Right. Like that's, that's, that's why we're here. Sam, I can't thank you enough. This has been awesome. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm looking forward to getting my first pair uh, right away. I'm going to go order some right now and I'm looking forward and I'll give you an update. I'll let you know how we're doing. I'll let you know how, uh, how my feet are going to get healthier and stronger as time here. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you. Love you. All right. Take care, my friend. All right.